Welcome to the Bucky Call for this uh, weekend, September 9th or 10th, depending on where you are. Everybody here on this call is on September 9th. Some are running a little bit later than others. <laughs> I think we have three time zones right here because you're central, right, Richard? Or mountain. Are you, you're mountain. So you and I are mountain. So, we, you know, uh, Joe is Eastern time. So this dude, it's lucky he's got his eyes open. Yeah. You should have two things. He should be sleeping. That's right. Yeah. And when this call is done, he... <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so, so welcome to the call tonight. We're continuing with our study of um, Buckminster Fuller, Critical Path, and we're on page 126. We're going to begin at the bottom of page 126 as we go through Bucky's chronophile, which was huge Ooh. for me this week. Uh, the concept of chronophile and why they're important. And I think I mentioned to you last week that I was writing a book. And during the week, I've been having this big spurt of writing. During the week, I said, I've really got to put some of my experiences in this book in order for people to understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. So I went down through and did a little cr chronology, a little bio. And then we come to this call and find out Bucky believes in this chronophile because it establishes a foundation mm -hmm. for the legitimacy, the le legitimacy of his, of all of his reasoning in the book *Critical Faculty*. So, in the first part, part one, he defines the problem. Now, part two, he's going to go to the solution. And the first thing he gives us is a chronophile of why he's qualified to answer and what achievements he's had. So, we're going to pick it up there, and I think that we're going to pick it up at item twelve on his list. Joe, how are you feeling, and what do you want to get out of tonight? I'm feeling very good. Um... You know, uh, I've been sick the past few days, uh, so uh, this is as good as I've been. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited to be here with you and Richard. Uh, it's a privilege, as always. So it's a, um, it's a great evening in that regard. Uh, and I, too, am interested in looking into uh, the documentation of, uh, of uh, Bucky's chronophile. And I think that, you know, this is an important part. I remember reading about it a while back. Uh, I know CJ has one. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Buckminster Fuller was keeping it since he was nine or something along, that line, along those lines, very long time. Uh, and what that does is it allows you to see patterns, allows him to see patterns that, um, that, you know, uh, over time about himself and society. And I really think it really provides him with a lot of the insights that he has, um, specifically in critical path. Uh, so, cause you, you can start to spot some economic trends and some business trends and some, uh, trends outside of traditional engineering and architecture. So I, I really think that this is uh, going to be an interesting part of the book. So I'm, I'm looking to get something out of that, at least from a, a, a documentation standpoint. Uh, so from uh, that, uh, Richard, how do you feel? And what would you like to take away from today? Well, this is, uh, I feel pretty good, actually. But uh, good. this is kind of uh, interesting in terms of the chronophile, but I'll come back to that. Uh, I, I, Every other Saturday morning, I'm also on a Zoom call that has to do with world weaving, and it's a spinoff of some of uh, the Bucky Fuller Design Science Lab work that's gone on in the past. Anyway, it was interesting today that the, the theme of being overwhelmed started to come through, um, and uh, that allowed me to connect with the formula, this n squared minus n over 2, to try and show people how um, that if you want to affect the relationship or the tension that goes on between um, two or more things that can add up to feeling overwhelmed, then there's a way you can sort of add things and exponentially increase the relationship, or you can take things away and and do the reverse in terms of of how many relationships you're trying to juggle. <laughs> uh, and and so I had a chance to talk about that. And the other thing is, is I've, I've been getting um, connections to a fellow, uh, person by the name of Anthony Judd, Judge. I don't know if you've heard of him or seen his writings, but he's got a blog that's 
Um, and he's 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 doing quite a lot in the area of tensegrity now. And the one that really caught me just recently um, had to do with you know a, a Bucky type word only it was a title. <laughs> And it was eliciting pattern of global consensus by attentional integrity, interweaving agreement and disagreement coherently with force directed layout tensegrity. <laughs> and I've just started to read it and I haven't really got it into my head, but the, the language of pattern, interweaving, <laughs> tension, tensegrity obviously caught my eye. So uh, I'm interested in getting a little bit deeper into that and sharing it. Uh, the chronophile, though, is really interesting for me because in another group, the trim tab group, we we talked about the chronophile. It may have been even a discussion coming out of critical path. But I, I said to the group, you know, it'd be interesting if we could take the chronophile and, and I had a, a reference to... Um, a charting that it was done on his chronophile and then parallel it with you like me us and so you can start out with you know we know when he was born and we know you know whatever we were born is going to be relative to to uh that date but the year we were born may in fact match with something that he was doing <laughs> and uh and for example, I realized, so I've done uh, about an 18 page chronophile of uh, listing his in one column and and some things about my life. Wow. And for example, in 1947, everybody sort of knows from the uh, Bucky side that uh, that was Black Mountain and some of his experiences. Then when I looked at myself, I realized that that was the year I started grade one. And it was the year that Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it, it's really been quite, quite interesting to run the two columns and uh, match them against dates that were significant uh, in Fuller's life and see what was transpiring in your life at sort of that same time. But so I, I'm really keen on taking away more learning out of uh, reading about the chronophile and discussing it. Wow. So back to you, Steve, and your feeling and what do you want to take away today? Well, I'm, I'm feeling really good. I've had a, an amazing freaking week where I've been working on a book for the last three years and I've got thousands of pages over here of drafts. And over the, we had the uh, Labor Day weekend in the US uh, last weekend and I was literally constipated. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was not well, but somehow I got through that on Sunday and on Monday uh, I, I got torched up and I actually have a first draft of part one of a book which hmm. is um, actually in answer to Joe's question. He sent me an email question. We talked about it, but I kept it as a um, as a kind of a, a uh, prompting, kind of as a muse for me to start this book. And so the first part of this book is, when is the best time to meditate, morning, noon, or night? And that's, I answer, I begin to answer that question. And I'm just really excited about it. And this is where I put my chronophile in on uh, last Friday, and then we had the call on Saturday and all of a sudden I was reaffirmed that here's Bucky's chronophile. And, uh, and then I had this clog. And then on that Monday, I got torched up and, and I'm doing one. And I, if I, if I showed you, I, everything that I wrote, I've got more to do. I mean, I've got every page looks just like this. So I'm not going to say I'm anywhere close, but I feel much closer to an outcome. And I think the chronophile actually helped me give me confidence to, uh, make my points um i'm gonna open up the uh the discussion here on the book but i just want to mention that susan is traveling and tam sent a email saying that she couldn't make it today and joe reported that julian uh commented that he's been he's has a project that's 
uh, in his way during the time of this meeting and that he'll do what he can to maybe join us at least for a few minutes one of these days. So that kind of introduces everybody. And I want to go back with something you said, Richard, because I don't think people get this n squared minus n over 2. And, uh, you know, there was a time in my, in fact, I looked at this chart. I, I think I knew what, what you meant when you said n squared. In other words, this is the formula, n squared minus n over 2 is the formula to determine the number of relationships that are possible when existing points or nodes are established. So um, if, if we have point A and point B, there's only one relationship. You know, there's two numbers there. So 2 squared minus, you know, 2 squared is 4 minus 2 divided by two is one. There's the answer. And if yeah. we have three points involved, then it's three squared minus three over two. Blam, we have three interrelationships. And so if, and I'm reading, I'm bringing this up because you were, you pointed to it. Every point in Bucky's chronophile is a node. And those nodes are connected with interrelationships, and every node has a potentially equal relationship with any other node. So this formula is perfect. If you have 13 points or 13 nodes, it's 13 squared minus 13 divided by 2. That'll tell you exactly how many relationships one could be looking at when one looks at this data. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And the other thing is, is that it's minimum in, yeah, the, it's minimum. in the spirit of minimum whole. And yeah. if it's one way, just the connection, yeah. then that formula answers it. But yeah. if it's two way, yeah. then you don't divide by two. So you get uh, uh, an even greater number and an easier formula, which I was having st struggles with, but Kirby Unger helped me. There's another formula called um, n n times n minus one gives you the same answer. So if you using four as your example, uh -huh. you the tetrahedron. So you get four uh, times n minus one. So four minus one is three. Okay. You get uh, four times three, and th this one's also divided by two. So you get four times three is twelve divided by two is six. Cool. Uh, and and so I I, right I kept sort of saying, like, why should I try and and learn this what looks like a more complicated formula n squared minus n, and and the other one is n. <clears throat> is the number of uh, nodes. N minus one is the number of nodes minus one. In other words, if you've got four, uh, you're not gonna have a relationship with yourself in this sense. Right. So you're only gonna connect out to uh, three others. And yeah. so you take N minus one, four minus one equals three, and then you multiply those two numbers, divide by two and you get the same answer. Well, Kirby finally showed me that it's actually exactly the same formula. Um, so that uh, um, I, I'd have to go over it again, but it's uh, it, it just, um, how would that work now? Anyway, I, 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 I finally got it in my head that uh, it's not a different formula that's given you the same answer. It's really just a different expression of the same formula that gives yeah. you the same answer. Right. And to me, that's the second one is easier to teach to somebody who and a square, right? Exactly is is afraid of math or doesn't like math or, <laughs> and it it really is a fairly simple times table kind of formula once once you get your head around it, but. Yeah, I mean that's the and then I you when you when you actually go further into what you're doing, uh, <clears throat> what you then discover is is that uh, when you go from three, let's say, um, uh, to 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 you go to three and three, and then you go to four and six, 
your three has doubled. So now instead of three interactions, you've got six interactions. And then when you go to five, the number of interactions basically increases by 1.5. Cool. And then when you go to six, the increase becomes uh, 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 two times, yeah. And so they, the exponential jump keeps going up sort of by, uh, by half and then full and then half again and then full. Um, and it, you can see how quickly the complexity of the interconnections increases by adding one or two uh, additional nodes. Right, sure. Um, yeah. And that, and if 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 what we keep talking about in terms of tensegrity and the tensional uh, compression tension stuff, then it's and the tension is what holds something together. Um, then we can see that when we're feeling overwhelmed it's not so much the the actual number of nodes that we're trying to deal with it's the number of potential interconnections between all the nodes <laughs> that can start to get us feeling overwhelmed and some of them are automatic like you you just you know get up in the morning and you go to your toothbrush and you brush your teeth <laughs> uh, that particular relationship um doesn't seem to be a of any concern um, until, <clears throat> um, and it's not necessarily the toothbrush, but it has to do with some people who say that, you know, um, the monthly cycles, uh, the full moon causes human behavior disturbances or causes different other kinds of things. So every other day of the month, <clears throat> Um, the moon phase doesn't matter, doesn't doesn't phase how you function. But at a particular time in a month, all of a sudden, the relationship to the moon becomes critical to what, what it is you're doing or not doing on a daily basis. <laughs> and, and so again, you see when certain tensions are critical <laughs> and, so, and sometimes when they're just part of what I do. And most of us go through each day, I think, dealing with relationships that are just kind of automatic. And until something really blows up, uh, then they're just, they're inconsequential. We just do them. Yeah. But and you set them aside, like, you know, burn down your town or your house. And, and then all of a sudden, getting up and going to work in the morning uh, has a whole different sort of uh, relationship issue for you. I, I want to make it really clear because there may be somebody looking at this video and I really want to remind myself that when I, as soon as the math comes up, n squared minus n over two or some other derivation that's more simple, more arithmetic. And by the way, Richard, if you find that and want to present it on this call, we can do that sometime if you have time to do that. But um, we'd love, I'd love to see that. But be, because it's, it's the math can be really intimidating. The important things to remember here is that if I have two points, I have interrelationships or yeah. relationships. And if I have three points, I have more interrelationships. And as you pointed out, these are minimums. Yeah. If I don't have, you pointed out a couple of things. One is the minimum. I can look in my life and see why things aren't working. At, just by looking at the nodes that are there and saying, Do, am I looking at all the interrelationships? And it's very possible that I'm habitually doing something that isn't really integrous with reality. And so it's not working. And over a period of time, I want to blame somebody else when it's me that didn't look at exactly what my potential relationships were. Does that make sense? I sure hope sure. so. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and you can do it another way. I did it one time. With a, well, I, two different ways of doing things, but I did it one time just to try and illustrate this with somebody. So I'm using my model that has validators and your own self and your people who you're close to and your societal uh, institutions that you have to deal with every day, whether it's transportation, health, education. So we just went through an exercise. So tell me, the first one was 
in a sense, how many parts do you have? And it was along the line of just saying, well, there's my psychology part, my emotional part, my physical part. And so it's like we said, ended up with four. And then we said, how many validators are you dealing with, whether it's a, a religion or a constitution or a community value? And we added up some of those. And we added up how many time, how many people she deals with in her daily life that are close friends or family, et cetera. And then we added up how many institutions do you deal with on a daily basis? And so we added up, I don't know, say 30 <laughs> altogether. Right. And then we applied the formula and I showed her how many relationships she was potentially dealing with on a on a daily basis. Yeah. And her her immediate um response to me uh unfiltered <laughs> yeah. was, was oh no wonder i wake up in the morning with a headache yeah. no <laughs> and and the point was is that she wasn't reinforcing the fact that she was dealing with all these these relationships she was re reinforcing the fact that she had she had a right to her headache yeah. <laughs> and and that changed the whole complexion when she realized that that it wasn't a um, a negative it wasn't a fault it wasn't a weakness uh it was actually a right that she had to have a headache if she's dealing with all those relationships <laughs> uh, and so, um, i think it's important uh, too is just identifying the number of relationships <clears throat> allows you to simplify yeah you know i mean and that's really the underlying principle there you know she could actually grasp now what she's dealing with yeah so then from there you can prioritize and scale down and i think that that's what the important part is once you start to see this and that gets back to the idea of formalization from there is that you're doing more with less once you identify what is is that you're actually dealing with so you, especially you're identifying all the resources involved in the energy that's being exchanged so then you cut back uh so that i think that that's a really critical thing that you know it's it's his first step it's it's almost saying that you know, you know um, i don't want to cheapen it but it, it, it you know it's like a stakeholder analysis of some sort but uh yeah 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 and so well, that doesn't, where that doesn't cheapen it yeah uh, there are many different windows to look at this with and just right. saying so that doesn't cheapen it at all. I love well, your idea of prioritization because sometimes I'm yep. dealing with, with information nodes that really I don't value. They're not valid. There's no validator for that node. Uh, and when I look at it, it has really nothing to do with my personal values. Right. Why am I contending with that thing? Let's reduce the number of dots. As you said, Joe, let's set some priorities. And so yeah. well, when, when, you, when you do that too, then you... you um, you reduce the number of interactions by an exponential number. Um, and uh, so in addition to, you know, the, the the general message to any one of us, if we're feeling overwhelmed, is to sort of say, well, you know, cut down, you know, cut this out, do this. Um, but the additional sort of impact of that is, is if I do that, then I can also see how many... Um, of this complex pattern of relationships i'm also cutting back on and that i don't have to deal with yeah. uh, and and it really can increase the ability to kind of you know if you want relax and go with the flow or whatever it is that might be done yeah joe did you have something else i was just going to say yeah the, um I, you know i'm thinking about this in an organizational sense Mm -hmm. where the connection may not be as meaningful to you, but it may be meaningful to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so that is another discovery and insight that you're given. And so then from there, um, uh, you know, you can set up scales and measure what's important to whom and as to why. Yeah. And so, and then from there, you can make an overall strategic plan on what to do. But yeah, I mean, this has a lot of obviously this, you know, this is always how a lot of, uh, you know, kind of struck me as very important is seeing the, you know, the connection between the nodes uh, yeah. uh, with Polar. I mean, that's one of the more 
reasons I was actually uh, drawn to him to begin with is that I always felt like he actually got that. Mm -hmm. We can call these these dots can be nodes. They can yeah. be they can be vertices. They, right, can, yeah. they can be facts. They can be people. I mean, yeah. just I start to apply this. Yeah. Now, Richard, you said two things that inspired me. One was the idea of identifying the, the number of relationships. And you said another thing about it going both ways. And this is really significant yeah. for me because I've come to see the difference between the word relationship. I'm, I'm And I'm arbitrarily making this decision. Yeah. Between relationship and interrelationship. That when I'm looking at my relationship to a thing, I'm being very one-sided. What I really could consider is my interrelationship and allow that word to mean something different. I can be very arbitrary. And I made a major discovery on this point. So I'm going to share this chart with you because this talks about the two ways. I, yeah, I, took, right. look at, I look, took a look at Bucky's tetrahedron, his point A, B, C, D, his defined N squared minus N over two relationships, which work out to be six. The brain stores the event or the vertex or the node and intuition, the mind must interrelate or relate those nodes. Bucky's real explicit about this. The brain stores, the mind interrelates or relates. Now, and you said it goes two ways and most people don't get this. And I was looking at this, I was looking at this chart. I'm going, well, wait a minute. When Bucky did his analysis of this, uh, diagram up here at the top of the ABC with the one, two, three, four, five, six. He he identified those. Let's go back at the sheet here. He identified them as A, B, B, C, A, C. And I go, now, why the hell did he do that? That's kind of arbitrary. Look on number four. He goes A, B, B, C. Then he goes, he doesn't finish with A's and he doesn't finish with B's. Then he goes C, D. Then he comes back to A and then goes A, C. Then he comes back to B and goes B, D and goes A, D. I'm going, what? Why did he do that? So then I created this chart. I stuck, I created a grid uh, and I don't, I, I, I need to put the other grid, but with, it basically was four A, B, C, D across the top and then A, B, C, D down the left-hand side and then started doing the matching. And lo and behold, when I, when I matched the top value on the chart first to the second value, uh, to the vertical value on the chart second, I came up with A, B, then A, C, then A, D, then B, C, then B, D, then C, D. And there, there's his relationship. That's one way. The other way is B, A, C, A, C, B, et cetera. And I started pondering this. And I'm going, why did Bucky pick that side of the, what turns out to be some kind of a triangle? If the if the ABC, if I had all the values there across the top and down the vertical side, it would be a straight line down through. In fact, I could probably find it pretty quickly. Here it is right here. Um, see, there's A, B, C, D, and then A, B, C, D uh, across vertically, horizontally, across top vertically. And then I just started matching up and notice that neutral line in between is where the a has a relationship with itself, the B has a relationship with itself, and the C has a relationship with it, and the D. Do I have a relationship with myself? That was my first question. Am I really, am I just assuming, and, and the way I like to do it is that it's my mind and my brain. AA represents my relationship with my brain to my mind. That's one way, but then there's another part, my mind to my brain, right? And Bucky just drew a line down through this and used all of the values on the upper right-hand side of the chart. It and the values, and then what's that, Joe? Well, one, two, three, four. Okay. See, yeah. what's interesting on that too is that you've got a four by four matrix, which is four by four, 16. Then you take out those uh, doubles yes. uh, right. minus four and you got 12. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's the formula, isn't it? Yeah. N squared, I got four values, is 16, and take out the four down the middle, minus N, and divide it by two, and there I got my left hand, the upper right, and the lower left. That's yeah, the and, then, and, then right you, and then you don't, in, in this one, then you don't divide by two, you just... Uh, Pick the upper uh, right. You just keep the 12, not, not right. divide... 
but, but those 12 but you can are, also do you can also t in for me and that the way you're illustrating it i could do the n squared minus n um uh over two and i get six and then if you were showing me that chart then i would say oh now i've got to then go times two six times two right so i bring it back to 12. <laughs> see that's exactly right because this is concave and convex when right. bucky did it one side is concave the other side is convex the the concave side is 360 degrees the convex side is 360 degrees voila 720. yeah and so in any reality where I look and look all around me at 360 degrees, there's actually 720 degrees to be concerned about, right? It's me to it and it to me. And that becomes the interrelationship. Anyway. Yeah, and, and then all you have to do, uh, because we got three here, um, the, the, the initial formula says there's three connections between the three of us. But when you do the interconnection, then we realize, oh, wait a minute, there's uh, uh, there's double that. There's actually six because there's me to you, you to me, me right. you to Joe, Joe to you, Joe to me, me to Joe. <laughs> and <laughs> and we get that um, doubling of the interrelationship. And it's the concave and the convex. It's the 720 degrees rather than the 360. And this is so important. If I'm in an organization and I'm relating in that organization, me to you, and I'm missing out on the you to me. I'm missing a big part of that, of the integrity of that system. Mm -hmm. I'm right. dominating right. the system, right? And I need to stop and say, well, Richard, what's your point on this, really? Let's get to this. That's why I love the fact on these calls, we say, how are you feeling? And what do you expect today? So at least you get it off your chest. And if you're lucky, uh, we actually deal with it. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, in a way, it kind of reminds me anyway of a um, a, uh, a directed and undirected graph. I don't even know what that is, Joe. Please teach me. Uh, so it's just a, an undirected graph is like a direct uh, <clears throat> has like edges that don't have a direction and there's like that essentially means there's a two-way relationship between the nodes whereas if it's a directed graph there's a one-way relationship between the edges and, and the nodes so it's going in a single direction mm -hmm. um so there's you know in this particular instance obviously this is a uh uh undirected graph so it's kind of it can it shows the the relationships can go a number of different ways. I mean, it's just a <clears throat> something to notice that um, you know that's worth noting. I mean, it's uh, and it, you can kind of still see that in the, in the in the way when you put the boxes up again too. Yeah, uh, and the different combinations that come out of that. Uh, well, if I, kind of if see. I hear you correctly too, it's like. If I drew the um, the tetrahedron or even the one that we've got in front of us, uh, and I put a, an arrow on one end of, of the connection, then I've got a directed one. And right. if, uh, I could put an arrow on the other end, which shows going both ways, or, or, or no arrow. To, what you're saying is if you just leave it as the line, then it's it means undirected um, undirected yeah excellent which wow. means it can be it can turn into loops yeah yeah, yeah. that's so, the important thing so notice that bucky over here in cosmography which is the black and white chart on the left he goes a b b c c d and so looking at this chart i want to bring up the other chart over here where's the other chart did it go away i wanted to bring up that whole chart this guy here yeah let me see here there we go. Okay. So he goes A, B, B, C, C, D. And look, A, B, B, C. Notice that the that the numbers he says first are closest to the axis between concave and convex. That blew my mind. He didn't go A, A you know, A, B, A, C, A, D, or A, B, B, C, 
he went A, B, B, C, C, D. The, the, he mentioned the, the relationships that are closest to the, to the axis between concave and convex. I don't know. To me, that was just very significant. And I, and I pondered that and said, why the hell did he name it that way? Of all the ways to label it, why did he label it that way? That's been one of my problems. Is I've been trying to figure out what's, how Bucky has been thinking about this stuff. And so whether I'm even close to reality or not, it's been fun. <laughs> so, well, it goes and, two and part of that for me, especially when you get to the four, is that it's also a way to uh, number the interconnections uh, mm -hmm. and to make sure that you don't miss one or or double up one. <laughs> And and so in that sense, I think you you could you could start with um, I don't know A to D and call that one, <laughs> and yes, so you you, could. you can do any kind of combination you want, but in the end you will be able to see what you've got up there very clearly. You got four things and six interconnections, and you got them numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it doesn't matter if. At least for me right now, it doesn't matter whether A, B is, it can be any number you want. But when you finish, the combinations are going to have uh, six lines connecting. Right. Like I I was in a, um, a community college years ago in northern Alberta. It was a, a um, university type college. And I was there and I had five minutes uh, to be a participant in a two hour meeting. So I did my five minutes and I'm twiddling my thumbs as everybody else talks and does whatever they were doing. And I looked on the wall and I saw a, a wall mural uh, that was, it was a line drawing, but it looked like it had four heads or four pinnacles. And so I sat there <laughs> And I tried to like close my eyes and start counting the lines. I said, because if this is what I think it is, though there's going to be six lines between these four, whatever that I could see. But then I would count one line and then I would go to the next one and then it would it would overlap with another one and I would lose my count. And it took me the better part of that two hours to figure out I'm right. There is six, and I went one, two, three, four, five, six. I had them identified. Well, <laughs> but I, I think that but, you, but what you you've done that. is uh, would have saved me all that trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I think using a colored pen really helps. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's always helps. <laughs> so, so there's one more point I want to bring up about this because this is the result of three years of going through synergetics and cosmography and Bucky, but. I mentioned that it's concave in the white area down here, and it's convex down below, 360 plus 367, 20. That math is in synergetics. But also, um, this is not only concave and convex, it's cosine and sine. So one can see the gray area as being the imaginary numbers and the white area being the real numbers. And just like in quantum mechanics, it's easy to do uh, in physics. It's easy to do physics calculations with imaginary numbers. It's much more difficult to do them without. And if there's a great video, and in fact, I'll put it on the, uh, I'll put it in the, um, um, in the chat here. There's a great video on the history of imaginary numbers and how uh, during the Renaissance, uh, people came to imaginary numbers. At first, they were only used to, if I had a square like of, of 20, I've had uh, imaginary numbers were the space where the, where the thing wasn't. And they used it as a trick to calculate uh, square feet in an, in an area. They said, okay, well, this area is not here, so we're going to subtract that from this. And in a sense, that was the beginning of imaginary numbers. It's really powerful. So this is cosine and sine. This is what creates reality, the tetrahedron, the convex, and the unseen, invisible, or subvisible convex, the concave and the subvisible convex. Anyway, um, we could go into the uh, circles of irrelevancy here, which is all about consciousness. 
And it examines this idea of concave and convex as well. But, uh, you know, the, my whole point tonight was these little points on this, on this tetrahedron are historical facts, and those interrelate to greater context, which gives Bucky the authority to solve the problems in part two of the book. <laughs> That's the introduction. <laughs> so any other points, though, before we leave this? Because uh, it's, it's, to me, it's wonderful to look at uh, Look at this. Yeah, I always enjoyed looking looking back at this. Um, I always thought that this was very helpful. Um, I remember, yeah. we, you know, we created a values chart out of this. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was a really important thing on how to prioritize uh, what what was actually valued, what was the most important thing. Uh, and essentially, and it would identify any kind of conflicts. Yeah, uh, with those values, that was the most important. You know. Yeah, and but Joe, I, I I'm going to nitpick a little bit. We didn't create the value chart out of this in our project. Somebody created a value chart, and as we investigated the value chart, we saw the similarity of that chart to this matrix. Correct. Like Correct. Bucky had established the tetrahedral relationships of values as the underlying structure. Human beings don't look at the underlying structure. We just function with our little value system up here. That's but a we, very good point. Yeah, when we start to really analyze our values, we start seeing there is a structure to the way brain and mind interrelate or relate on a one-way basis or interrelate on a two-way basis. Any other thoughts or comments? No, this is to say, uh, and it, it, it also um, um, allows one to to dialogue about whether or not you have a relationship yourself in other words can your mind and your um kind of a brain work back and forth yeah and and i think there is an argument to to say that yes you can have those kinds of relationships in the same way that we were talking at one other point about um uh, self and awareness and otherness and the fact that very often little children explore themselves um and are encouraged to do that uh through the extremities right of their body so it's learning what the nose is the ear is and the toe yeah. and so forth but even and more... kids do it, it uh, uh intuitively too they right. they actually invite you to uh follow what they're pointing at themselves right. and then you can make the connection though well, that's called a nose or that's called an ear <laughs> yeah. and what's even as you what you bring up here is even more powerful when the infant when i discovered wait these are my toes mm -hmm. <laughs> whoa this is my hand you know i can do something with this one that hand comes and goes but this one is mine <laughs> yeah <laughs> right and, and that, how does that relate to the very essence of my being? I mean, I just imagine myself sitting in a crib with all these objects moving around. And one day I discover that this thing that's waving around is my thing. Yeah. And I can put it in my <laughs> mouth and I can, and I can learn to even, you know, get quiet for a minute. So, well, I'm hoping that anybody who watches this recording are getting as much out of this as I am, because your guys' perspective on these, you know, interrelationships uh, we're all going to use maybe our own words and our own perspectives, but I love hearing you share, and and I'm delighted that it hasn't been a total waste of time. <laughs> Not at all. Good, wonderful. So here we are at the book. Is, is there anything we want to talk about before we hit the book? We're at point. We're no. at node number twelve. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, are you? Hey, uh, how are you feeling? Um, Joe, do you want to really try to read this thing? And can you do it without putting yourself out? You look um, kind of tired, my friend. Uh, you know what? L let me just see how far I get if I start coughing, and then we'll, 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 we'll you know, call it a day. Okay. So, well, be sure and let uh, others share. So don't put your don't beat yourself up. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe that's a sign. <laughs> um, well. Well, I sought never to promote or sell either my ideas or artifacts or to pay others to do so. I must never hire any agents to produce publicly for me nor engage any lecture, lit literary, 
or idea selling agents, nor hire personnel who would solicit support of any kind of my on my behalf. All support must be some spontaneously in, uh, engendered by evolution integrating of my inventions with the total evolution of human affairs. Can we pause right there? I, one of the sure. one of the in the sections of the book, Joe, when I'm answering your question, when is the best time to meditate? I put up here, why not ask the internet? That's one of the sections. Before I answer the question, I say, well, here's the question. Well, what where are we going to get the answer? Why not ask the internet? And one of the things I point out is the internet is filled with gimmicks. People are hired to put the gimmicks in, and 90% of the time, the guys are selling a freaking product. Right. So, and here's what he's saying right here. I'm not going to sell anything. I'm going to let it evolve uh, a total evolution of human affairs. I'm going to throw it out there, and if somebody picks it up, fine. If not, I'm not going to promote it. That's brave. That is. And then, you know, that's why, you, I mean, there wasn't an element that was, uh, he wasn't afraid to fail. Um, you know, so some of his homes didn't necessarily get adopted because, you know, he wasn't necessarily pushing them like that, like he traditionally would. He wasn't compromising. You know. Everything uh, so number... today is a brand. Everything today yeah. is a brand. It's just, oh, yeah. it's disgusting. Okay. That's, uh, this is also why they sort of the corollary with this was was his uh discussion about gestation periods and right. he would put a uh a gestation sort of time as to when he thought it might uh take that's on his next point. that's his next point is gestation oh is it yeah. okay yeah uh, very cool so, intuitive uh, go ahead Number 13, I assume that nature had its own unique gestation rates, not only for the birth of each new biological component of eco ecolo ecological inner support, but also for each inanimate technological artifact invention of human inner advantaging. Number 14. And, saw... and Richard, Richard, was there anything more you want to say about gestation? I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, the the one that always uh, has stuck in my mind was um, what he put on, as I understand, the gestation period or time for the dome to come into uh, common usage, if you want, uh, or applied usage. And it was almost, I think he said 25 years. Um, so r roughly... I think he said it around 1930, and in 1955 was when he, he was commissioned to put the dome on the Ford uh, atrium, and he had never done it before, and so uh, he really had no idea whether or not uh, that dome, when it came up to meet at the top, was actually going to meet, uh, but anyway, that's when it happened, and of course, it was just shortly after that that the uh, the army adopted the the domes to uh, helicopter up to the dew line, and um, those two always stand out when I read the gestation part of this section of critical path and the applied times that that it turned out to be almost right on the year or the dot. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, you complete? I'm complete. Thank you for sharing. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, number 14. I sought to develop my artifacts with ample anticipatory time margins so that they would be ready for use by society when society discovered though, through evolutionary emergencies that they needed just what I had developed. I realized that if new tool, if the new tools I had developed could provide valid human advantage increases, then they would be would inevitably be adopted by society during the successive inexorable emergencies would would dictate the the proper rate of regenerative regenerative gestation of spontaneously adopted social advances. Cool. Comments on that one. Thank you for pausing, Joe. Yeah. 
evolutionary emergencies. That's oh, going to be. Oh, I, I may, I may actually skip the line there. Inexorable emergencies that occur in a society, which evolution of emergence only through emergencies would dictate the proper rate of regenerative gestation of spontaneously adopted social advances. So forgive yeah. me. No, I, well, I was reading up above there in the sentence up above, but I think that's a good point. Go ahead, uh, Richard. Well, and again, using the Ford uh, building one, is that if he made that gestation sort of prediction in 1930, roughly, um, you know that he's now 35 years old. If you add 25 years onto it, uh, or yeah, 25 years onto it, um, you realize that he's now 55 when all of a sudden what he's been working on is being taken up. And there's not very many people in, in daily living that either would be told or go along with the idea that your first real um, uh, or the first real realization that whatever you're doing is good for society um, might not be until you're 50 plus years old. Yeah. Whereas most people seem to think that, you know, your your heyday is in your, let's say, your 20s or your 30s. And and a lot of people, I think, feel that if they haven't done some big thing by one of those ages, that they've sort of been a failure. Yeah. Uh, and there's so many examples of people like Bill, uh, Bucky that didn't get whatever they were doing in life uh coming together until they were an advanced age. And I'm actually in conversation with a fellow right now <clears throat> who has gone through all kinds of addiction and other kinds of recovery uh, types of difficulties. And he's on a real high right now because <clears throat> uh, he's had several years of everything's going well. Um, and in the course of our conversation uh, the other day, um then it becomes revealed that he's he's 69 years old and just itching to get on with the next whatever number of years that are are left um and he's full of enthusiasm and optimism of something that he's learned recently that he thinks will be uh, valuable to others and and his community and i think that's remarkable that somebody uh, has gone through um, what it sounds like he went through all those years and at 69 he's behaving like he's a six-year-old having just discovered something or a 20-year-old who's just graduated and is going to solve the problems of the world so it, it's it's really delightful to to uh, recognize that these milestone times that we arbitrarily put on ourselves um shouldn't be there or don't have to be there. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Okay. Well, number uh, 15. I sought to learn the most from my mistakes. Number 16. I sought to decrease time wasted in worried procrastination and time to time to increase time and to increase time invested in discovery of technology's effectiveness. Yeah, that's Number possible. 17. Let's pause right there. I mean, those are really significant. I sought to learn the most from my mistakes. You know, when I go to my associates and say, now, what did I do wrong there? You know, it's it's amazing how people say, oh, well, don't worry about it. It's okay. You didn't do anything wrong. No, I say, what did I do wrong? What, what were, let's look at this because I want to learn from my mistakes. And it's amazing to me how people are so reluctant to do that. And even they're reluctant to help me do that. Have you guys noticed that in your life? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. No, and I think one of those mistakes is that he's actually scaled back on procrastinating. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, the other thing is is that um, he's looking to uh, increase the time uh, and discovery of uh, of technological effectiveness, which is actually different than technological efficiency. 
Uh, so that's a really important distinction to make where make you're just trying to make make that distinction well, joe What's the difference? efficiency just makes a current process go a little bit faster effectiveness is actually changing the process to right. um to be become a more uh, uh you know increase the output a, increase the output and change the way you're actually doing something yeah. So it's yeah. improvement. It's an actual improvement. Whereas efficiency, right. you know, is just, and you know, I'll give the example of Elon Musk. You know, he had robots on the assembly line. Uh, he could have focused on the robots going faster, uh, but he didn't. He actually focused on how to make the car faster. And they came up with a gigapress and how that gigapress essentially allows them to build the car faster decreases energy use and actually they don't need the robots right now yeah yeah so yeah cool. on that um joe i i'm currently in um uh, sort of a debate with with colleagues sometimes it's just me being critical of something that's been written um <laughs> but for those who talk about research in this field of suicidology, um, and you read some of their documents, and I've just been reading two or three of them, some of them even have to do with my the company that I had. But there's a muddied mix of people's understanding of efficacy, effectiveness, yeah. efficiency, and impact. Um, right. And... Efficacy, generally speaking, means a laboratory-controlled kind of, of experiment. And effectiveness is when you put it in real time and it you know does what you just talked about. Efficiency does, uh, again, what you just said. And what my example is that in one of the first pieces of research one of my colleagues did is that the, the problem we had is that people would not openly ask uh, directly whether or not you're thinking of suicide. So we measured pre and post uh, once we developed our training program. And we found in pre, it took 19 minutes before anyone got anywhere near close to asking directly about what was going on in that person's life. After the training, that 17 or 19 minutes went down to nine. So you had an efficiency sort of score that you could give to that. Uh, but that didn't tell you whether it was effective. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's exactly uh, right. And uh, That's a so wonderful example. Do, do you have a, a, any, any kind of uh, literature or written um, sort of distinction between efficacy, effectiveness, efficiency, and... I, I do. And I have, yeah, I do. Actually, I do. And I can share that with you. Oh, um, that would be great. So, yeah, no. Um, so it, 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 I have a set of definitions, but that's that's um, it's a really important thing because a lot of people t so often, you know, uh, say that they look at time as a metric. And this is where it's a problem when people manage themselves to metrics as opposed to managing themselves to what they're doing in the first place. So you mm. look at it and say, I can finish this in eight minutes versus 20. Well, that's great, but you're still taking the same path to get there. So mm -hmm. you never ask yourself in the beginning, do you need to go down that path to begin with? And that's the important point is like the idea is, does that need to be done? And that's where people, they just get caught up on making the same thing faster and yeah. don't worry about more than the, and what, remember the whole point of looking the connections between the nodes is to do more with less. It's to reduce what actually needs to be done. So it's to see the interconnections between those nodes and saying, you know, we need to do, we can do one thing instead of having to do two. I have a really good example of, to expand on what Richard said and what you're saying, Joe. Uh, he talked about how he had a process. He, re, he re went from 19 minutes down to nine minutes, and everybody was real excited. 
I had a I I had a got involved at consulting a marketing company. They had like 35 agents and they were trying to develop franchisees. And so they were they when I got there, the the maximum hold time for calls was 45 minutes. And the reason why it was maximum is because that's when the phone hung up on the people. So, you know, anything over 45 minutes, we don't know how long they were on hold or how many times they had to call back. Well, I got on with that group and started uh, developing the scripts and started doing a simple thing like looking at the volume of calls and making an appointment with somebody uh, during a slow time and seeing, can you call back right at this time? And then all of a sudden the call started to equalize. And then I came out with these reports and I had a list of people and how much time they were spending on calls. And so uh, caller, you know, agent one through 10 were spending this much time and agents uh, 11 through 20 were spending that much time. And the, and the management company looked at it and says, look at these guys who are just wasting all this time on the phones. Look, these guys are getting off in nine minutes. This other guy was at 19 minutes. And they were ready to, he said, they said, what, they're writing down the names of the guys who were out there at 19 <laughs> minutes. I said, what the hell are you doing? We're gonna fire these guys. Because the other guys are at nine minutes. I said, wait a minute, look at the second part of the report. You know, the guys who were doing the 19 minutes had fewer callbacks. The problems were resolved. And the guys who were doing the nine minutes and get off the phone, these people were calling back over and over again, frustrated because they couldn't get their questions answered. So somewhere this fits in efficacy, effectiveness. Eff what words would you use to describe what I just said? What's what's effic what is efficient? Well, efficiency would be the 19 minutes. Um, uh, down to no, nine. Actually, I'd say, that, yeah, down to nine. And 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 then so, um, the, the yeah, that would be efficiency. The effectiveness would be the ones where you don't get the call back. Yeah. Would so be that's the, the effect. That's that's the effectiveness. Or would be the 19. So, yeah. Would be the 19. So. And then, and then the the nine, yeah, the nine would be the efficiency, but they wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily see the benefits of it, like because, and that's where you have your on the assembly line. Um, again, does everybody need to be part of this process to begin with? Yeah. And, and that's and instead of saying, hey, everybody's doing it faster. Yeah. that that's essentially what it is and so um yeah you, you're and but you're also uh what part would be efficacy well e e efficacy for me in that example would be if you <clears throat> if you did it with let's say that little organization that you were dealing with and and you you came up with the efficiency answer you came up with the effectiveness answer um and then you, uh, and that would be a efficacy. Your efficacy sort of result would be, well, yeah, it looked like the efficiency, you know, should win. But when you look at it, the other part of the report, you realize that actually it was more effective to have the 19 minutes and no callbacks. <laughs> um, but now then, so that's an that to me is an efficacy test. It. It's effective, but it's still kind of laboratory. It's just, you know, one little organization. Now, if you want to scale it out and see whether it holds with a bigger organization or several organizations and you get the same results, now you've, now you've got an effectiveness result. That, that's uh, that's how I'm quite... trying to figure out uh, how to distinguish between efficacy and and effectiveness in something other than the traditional efficacy is done in a lab, effectiveness is measured out in the real world. Um, so I, I'm not sure I've got it right, but that's kind of where my head is now in trying to distinguish efficacy, between those three. Efficacy is more related to the theoretical analysis of the comparative effective and efficient. We're going to compare the effective answer. We're going to compare the efficient answer. We're going to get efficacy by comparing the two and seeing what result is creating. Correct. And, yeah. But, yeah. And, and, and you've got to, when I compare it to the lab thing, you've got it under control. Like there's quite controlled conditions. Um, when you put it, when you measure it out in the real world, you can't control for everything. Right. Um, and so if it holds out there, <laughs> then you're pretty sure you've got a, a pretty good product. Um, 
I think I think that I don't know if this is sidetracking, but I think this is part of what what happened with COVID, the vaccines, is is that um, there's there's been so much improvement over the years in efficacy testing, laboratory testing that these vaccines uh, are good or they're not so good, and that once the efficacy evidence is there, you can put it out into the real world and you can do some effective measures. I think what a lot of people uh, have, I think have thought that um, you can't get the effective result out of the efficacy sort of lab tests of these vaccines. And so their their head is stuck in something old where that was true. <laughs> uh, it it takes a lot longer to actually test out the vaccine. Now they can do it much faster. Uh, but those of us who are supposed to be at the receiving end, yeah. um, we may not have processed that uh, as quickly as what the uh, the scientists are doing. And so we get scared of saying, wait a minute, that's too soon. Uh, I can't trust whether or not that's going to help me or not help me. Um, anyway, that's just my thinking about why uh, uh, people have, have become so addled about whether or not the vaccines are are safe or not safe and yeah. or or effective and not effective because there's a... Uh, uh, we really were running on efficacy, uh, but it was good efficacy. There's short-term uh, analysis, and then there's long-term analysis. Yeah, and that and that to me is another way to say short-term is efficacy, long-term is effectiveness. Yeah, and I think this is a rhetorical issue. I mean, part of me wants there's a political aspect in terms of these vaccines. <laughs> in coming back to the issue of efficacy, effectiveness, efficiency. It's rhetorical. In other words, these words are actually thrown around quite um, interchangeably. All the time. Oh, yeah. No, they, and yeah. and no. it really serves to sit down and say, let's agree on exactly what these words mean. And just like we're struggling, you know, with, to come up with, oh, well, this is short term and then there's long term and, and put it in a context and resolve the re rhetorical ambiguity by being arbitrary and setting up clear definitions and then testing those definitions over time to make sure they apply in a short term or in a long term or does the adjective short term long term need to be inserted in front of each of those words before they're used and it's a this wording is really critical you know well that's the whole point of actually you know you need to um uh simplify then optimize the process that's you know the whole point of that is that you're simplifying in order to uh then you make it more efficient then you you know you you but you simplify it first because otherwise you're just you know if you're running your head into the wall you're just gonna run your head into the wall a little faster right on yeah <laughs> so so number 17 mm -hmm. I sought to document my development in the official records of humanity by applying for a for and being granted government patents. 18. Above all, I sought to comprehend the principles of eternally regenerative universe and to discover human functioning therein, thereby to discover nature's governing complexes of generalized principles and to employ these principles in the development of the specific artifacts that would benefit humanity's fulfillment of its essential functioning in the cosmic scheme. Number 19. I sought to educate myself comprehensively regarding nature's inventory of chemical elements, their weights, performance characteristics, relative abundances, geographical whereabouts, metallurgical inner alloy abilities, chemical associabilities, and disassociabilities. Yeah, let's I pause. To jump. pause. Let's pause. Right, that's, why don't we let me finish 19? That's um, still 19. Uh, yeah, I want to comment on 18. Go ahead and finish 19. Um, okay, uh, so I sought to comprehend the full gamut of production tool capabilities, energy, resources, and all the relevant geological 
meteorological, demographic, and economic data, as well as to comprehend the logistics and vital statistics thus far methodically amassed by humanities as derived from its all history experiences. Okay. Uh, I want to comment on 18. Anybody else have a comment on 18? Um, uh, I think this is really important. Above all, I sought to comprehend the principles to discover human functioning therein. Um, to me, I translate, translate in, in terms of saying, I'm not going to do anything unless I understand the principles that I'm being utilizing, that I'm utilizing at this point. In other words, let's say I have to wash the dishes. Okay, so what's my purpose in washing these dishes? Is it just some pain in the ass that I have to get done and I'm going to throw dishes around and be angry the whole time and experience? Is my purpose to experience my emotional anger and see what I can do, uh, how far I can throw dishes without breaking them? Or is my pr the principle I'm going to employ here to practice deep breathing and meditation and relax and relaxation while I'm watching these dishes? Or is my purpose to have the cleanest possible dish? Or is my purpose to look at the food that's on the dish and determine how I could serve the food or clean up the dish before? In other words, comprehend the principles of eternally regenerative universe to discover human functioning therein. There, I'm hearing him say, have an etern a general principle as a purpose that you're exploring while you're doing something. That's what I see there. How does it fit in the cosmic scheme? What's the well, big picture? Go ahead. Go ahead, Richard. Well, when I worked with this uh, uh, quite a long time ago now, but um, the other part of, of his statement has to do with... Um, in his mind, discovering the human functioning function. <laughs> and in order to do that, in order to maintain this eternally regenerative universe, because um, he was basically saying, what the hell are we doing uh, as human beings uh, in this universe? What is our contribution? Um, and, uh, and, and his answer, if I got it right, was that he ended up saying, oh, okay, the human functioning answer is we're here to be information gatherers and problem solvers. And, and we have the mind, if you want, capacity to do this that a lot of other animate uh, um, animals, if you want, don't have. And so we've got this exquisite sort of ability to gather information, analyze it, work with it, and and come up with problem-solving approaches. But that has to be done to uh, advance the principle of an eternally generative universe. If it's not doing that, which is what all the capitalism kind of criticism is all about these days, is, is that you know the argument is the capitalist is is ruining the world it's, it's they're not they're not trying to maintain an eternally regenerative universe mm -hmm. um so anyway that's the i've i've got the the quotes somewhere that says that his answer to that question was we human beings are information local information gatherers and problem solvers yeah. And uh, see, to me, I like to break out what he's actually saying because the sentences are so compounded. Mm -hmm. There are so many points bringing out there that it's easy to get lost. Above all, I sought to comprehend principles of eternally generative universe. Why did he do that? In order to discover human functioning therein. And what happened as a result of that? He could discover nature's governing complexes of generalized principles. And why did he do that? And this is the punchline for me. Employ these principles in the development of specific artifacts, in other words, specific outcomes, specific results that would benefit humanity's fulfillment of its essential functioning in the cosmic scheme. In other words, I'm going to come back to this. Why am I washing these dishes? What experience am I looking for here? 
Do I just want to be angry the whole time or do I want to experience something more meaningful? Is it possible that I can, in this experience, actually implement regenerative universal principles in order to develop a specific outcome on these dishes that would not only benefit me, but benefit my family and humanity in terms of us fulfilling our essential functioning in the cosmic universe. Now, to me, when I read Bucky, that's the way I've got to do it. Because if I don't, it's just compounded into these interrelationships. There's one, two, three, four points there. And those points, like this is Pat last point, could probably be broken into two or three sub points. <laughs> With, the, with being four points, that's 16 interrelationships occurring right there in that sentence. Anyway, that's why I didn't want to leave that behind. Yeah. I think this is saying find a purpose. No, I agree. Find a purpose and, and create an artifact on purpose. You know? No, no, that's okay. Yeah, and that's, that's why I don't know, like, for example, so what <clears throat> what's the benefit or the value of me washing the dishes? Right. Um, right. And um if i'm i'm annoyed and don't like to do it and whatever yeah. it might be i can be angry but yeah. if i also look and say if i don't wash the dishes right. and there's germs left on the dishes and my family yeah. eats off that plate next time they may get sick yeah um so um uh, i gather information about um <laughs> uh, all the things that go into having to wash dishes uh, I come up with a problem-solving sort of answer that says, oh, this all adds up to me, but I should be pissed off and angry and throwing plates around, testing their ability to not break. Or you end up saying, well, wait a minute, the other problem-solving is that if I clean the dishes um, quietly and so forth, calmly, uh, I save my family the risk of putting food on those dirty dishes next time and getting ill or sick or whatever it might be. So now you now you can weigh between those two, just those two options. I'm um, I have to wash the dishes in order for to justify being angry, <laughs> or I wash the dishes in order to solve the problem of my family not getting sick next time they eat off that plate. I don't know. That's that's kind of how I was processing it. <laughs> yeah, me too. And notice the relationship I put in here. He says, employ these principles. I hate uh, pronouns because pronouns uh, ambiguate the whole situation. Which which are these principles? These eternally regenerative universal principles. That's what he talked about above. So I get rid of all the pronouns. So I look at what he's actually saying. I said artifacts, outcomes. Artifacts could be a different word than outcomes, but that seems to be very practical. And then notice the relationship between discover human and functioning. He's He looks at these principles in order to discover human and functioning. Then he the fulfillment of essential functioning of these humans. And so what he's saying there is like, we could we could talk for an hour on this process. And And Richard, you're a psychologist there are times when it's absolutely cathartic and healing and essential that I go ahead and be as angry as I possibly can while I'm watching these dishes in order to find out what that what the hell that is all about. Why am I so angry washing these dishes? And sometimes the best way to find out, uh, to comprehend the principles of return of this universe, it's important for me to get into that emotion and maximize that emotion and play it out for all it's freaking worth. You know, if I'm going to be a bear today, be a really big bear. You know, I don't know. I, I, I was certified as a clinical hypnotherapist. So maybe I'm pushing the boundaries of, <laughs> of, um, of uh, conventional psychology. And, but uh, that's what I would say. There are times when it's appropriate to be angry washing the dishes. <laughs> yeah, that could be. And it's, and it's, uh, might even be appropriate <laughs> to throw them around uh, exactly. and break a few. Dude. On the other, on the other hand, somebody might say, "Look, don't don't take it out on the dishes. Here's the timeout room. Go in there and be as angry as you want." <laughs> right. Oh, and listen, I did a workshop, a self actualization workshop, where one of the processes was I invited people to bring dishes and glasses uh, to the event, and then we went out to a handball court outside that had a cement wall and cement floor, and we stood in the corner and wrote down all the reasons why we wanted to break those dishes. 
and let everybody really get into what it is they're so angry about and just break the hell out of those dishes. And afterwards, it was a cement floor, you know, cement backdrop, <laughs> cement floor. We just swept it all up and put all that trash in a bucket and said, okay, here's all your anger. What are we going to do with it now? Let's put it in the trash. Into the recycle bin it goes, right? So, yeah. And you were using uh, dishes that weren't... Um... Essential to the family's uh, functioning. E e essential to somebody else, or yeah, to the family's exactly. functioning. Yeah. So <laughs> they were surplus, and they could serve the function of getting it off your chest. Absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah beautiful. Right. Gosh, I love breaking Bucky down like I just did here in eighteen. I mean, and I do that all the time because his sentences are so compound, and his words are so. Yeah, I agree. Uh, his words are so contrived to be specific. And in as a result, sometimes they they feel ambiguous. Okay, so then you read nineteen. What do we have on nineteen? Anybody have any? Well, uh, just, just stay on that one for a okay, minute, though, stay. because I want to go back to what we often hear uh, Joe talking about, and that's putting a focus on the principles. Yeah. So yes. when I break it down, then I want to come back and say, "Oh, okay, now I know what the the functioning part is. I'm supposed to be a gatherer and a problem solver." But what are these principles uh, that uh, 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 of a eternally regenerative universe? What are they? And that's can they be articulated in the way that we've been uh, breaking yeah. it down? And to me, I, I out of our kinds of discussions, I would I would either turn to Joe and say help us with this or he would jump in already and be saying here's what i think are the principles that we we uh need to sort of uh articulate and be have in in our know-how or in, not in our know-how but in our knowledge <laughs> our awareness yeah no i i <clears throat> there this is essential essentially um you know because when he talks about the essential functioning, you're already getting back, you know, getting down to what is the particular. So it has to lead back to a principle, right? So that this the, the functions actually have to lead back to a principle that you're you're <clears throat> working from. So yeah, this is essential, um, and to have a framework uh, where you can apply. Um, um, you know, I, I have one framework that a friend had shared with me that that works pretty good with a lot, of, a lot of different projects. I'll, and I just would say a lot, and um, uh, and so <clears throat> that that uh, you know that gives you a set of principles that you can go by. Um, and uh, no, I, and I think that that's, that, you know, you have to ask yourself that because it kind of keeps everything within scope. Otherwise, you start doing things that are unnecessary um, and, you know, you forget why you're doing something in the first place, especially on, if you're doing things at scale. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I mean, I'm even getting more and more depth as I continue to read what he's saying and how. This goes back to the n squared minus n over two. I mean, we have nodes here of, of little perturbations in the quantum field of significance. We put words on those perturbations and then we put adjectives uh, on the words and they interrelate in some ways. And Bucky's just really amazing about this. Everything connects to everything to a point of driving me crazy some days. All right. Are we ready to move to 19? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Did we, we read it already. Anybody have any points there? This goes back to Bucky's, remember his <clears throat> charts about metallurgy, the evolution of human technology and advancement of commerce uh, with the development of metal, metallurgy, uh, metallurgy and different alloys being put together. That's how he went from, you know, bronze to brass, you know, iron to brass to brand, uh, to you know however that happened i think iron was first and i think bronze was next or brass was uh, bronze was next and then then brass maybe you know but and these chemical associabilities um and disassociabilities so like some stuff works together and some stuff doesn't and he wanted to understand that in relationship 
um, to comprehend a full gamut of production tool capabilities. This is like Elon Musk saying, well, I want a more uh, productive um, car factory. So instead of increasing the speed of my robots, I'll decrease the number of robots, you know, because yeah. there are inter alloyabilities and chemical or design associabilities and disassociabilities. And I'm going to see what those are and do an ephemeral analysis and comprehend the full gamut of production tool capabilities based on all that. Any other thoughts coming out from you guys? Yeah, like to me, the first half of that, that 19 is now speaking to information gathering. Yeah, exactly. And, right. and the second part deals with the problem solving. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, one, I mean, this is the thing that most people, um, in my mind anyway, that that have studied Fuller um, right. and what he's, he's tried to do there in that first half, it, it boggles your mind that he can even think of all those things, let alone sort of come up right. with a way to inventory them. <laughs> um, and you know he's he's really on to the 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 importance of having comprehensive data <laughs> yeah uh, and and then you turn it into a a uh, uh, a problem solving uh, right. action which in this case is the production of some kind of tool capability that's going to benefit all of humanity and not just um the privileged few and all those kinds of things that he talks about. Right. So the historical facts are A, B, C, and D. And then he starts with, and he stores those in his brain. And then he develops the inner relationships through intuition and mind. And that's mm -hmm. where the one, two, three, four, five, six comes in. And that's what basically he's saying. That's what he's doing right here. First part, I'm gathering the nodes. Second part, I'm going to comprehend the capabilities, the energy resources, and mm -hmm. all of the, uh, yeah. the aspects. It, it's interesting because you know you're thinking about the principles in the previous one, but, you know, <clears throat> and some of the measures that you could actually talk, you know, that would be universal. I mean, as you could say is, you know, obviously something like performance, but then you say underneath that quality and then you'd say uh you know how you define quality within that and then how do you define resource uh you know savings or resource uh you know allocation within that and then workload within that those three things actually give you a really good insight as to whether or not um you're you know and now that you further break those down right quality is is you know, kind of a very broad concept, but you can break those three down into uh, into a framework that actually really allows you. To, those are principles that you can use and manage yourself to. Um, uh, and there is a whole framework that my friend has developed that uh, quantifies all that. Hmm. It's pretty interesting. Cool. Um... We're at 10.50, and we started a little bit beyond the appointed time, and there's only three of us here. We should be able to finish fairly close to the appointed time. Uh, why am I grateful for everybody's input? Uh, Richard, how are you feeling, and what are your key takeaways today? We did a lot of good stuff. Yeah, well, I'm certainly feeling pretty good about it. Uh, robust, I guess, might be the uh, one of the adjectives of it. Because it's, um, in a sense, it's a continuation of uh, a lot of what was being discussed this morning, only it's, uh, we've been able to take it a little bit further because I, whenever we got into the, the, the talk about being overwhelmed at work or in daily life and whatnot, I brought up the formula N squared minus N, but we didn't really spend much time on it. This, tonight, I thought we... We we spent a little bit of time on it. We drew it out. We we appreciated some deeper understandings of of what that formula is all about, and especially the the uh, understanding of the 
um, directional or non-directional, as, as Joe described, or the way in which we described it, the difference between the relationship and interrelationship. <laughs> um, and they all speak to um, the nature of the complexity and, and how it can increase exponentially uh, with the number of nodes that you either add or or take away. So it it really was a bookend kind of day for me, uh, what we started off this morning and what we're finishing off tonight. Uh, so I've, I really appreciate it and appreciate the way in which um, we've kind of been privileged to uh, get rid of all the the riffraff of other people discussing <laughs> and it could, ju could just be the three of us. <laughs> so, I, well, I've entered uh, the thing that if, uh, if John were here or Anna, any of them, they would have jumped right in and. Oh yeah. 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 Give up. yeah. I was just feeling uh, selfish that, I had, yeah. uh, that we got to do this. The, the two of you to myself kind of thing. Right. So, uh, so Joe, how are you feeling? What are you taking away? Um, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, you know, I really appreciate anytime we have a discussion about, you know, effective and effectiveness and efficiency, how these things are used interchangeably, and we have new examples that we can go off. Uh, I really like the uh, addition of efficacy. You know, um, that's something that I've not, you know, considered, but it, and that's a really important point, uh, particularly when I was thinking when Steve's example because the efficacy comes in the measurement and the idea meaning the the actual metric that you're deciding to make your decision upon so if it's it's not necessarily just say the time or something along those lines it's like what are you actually looking at that's the efficacy test and many times people will end up managing themselves to a metric like time you know, and like mm -hmm. uh, something, you know, that is really not meaningful. And so what happens is, and this is one of the uh, things with the OODA loop that they talk about all the time. I don't know if, you, if anybody's familiar with that, but um, but in any case, that the they're reorienting all the time is they are not always focused on metrics. They're focused on reorientation and focusing, making sure that they're looking at what they're measuring is valuable. And so that's what efficacy is actually uh, is the way you were using it, Richard, was very important. So I thought that that was a, a, a very nice add into that um, into that process uh, so that, you know, it, it, it's something I've thought about. I just haven't put a word to uh, yet. So um, and that is essential. Uh, you know, the, the, I think the relationships between events uh obviously um and then how do you kind of figure out what the you know what's your what's your you know uh, minimum number or maximum number of, of connections and then once you have your maximum number of connections how do you then simplify from there right and so that comes back to the idea then that that's the effectiveness part and then you become more efficient within those fields uh, mm -hmm. afterwards and so that that's that's an example of that as well kind of coming together um so lastly i think the idea of principles is essential um you know that's something that uh, all the time i think about it in terms of whether it be ethics or even in terms of uh, any type of project um you know you start you know there's some basic measures that you can keep coming back to um you know the you know the your values and then uh you know what is the what is the, how are you performing against those values and so and what is the quality and then you know what are the resources that you're using and because they may be else better used elsewhere and then what's workload look like so that, but it, that's a very complex thing but um but that also brings that into into uh into the discussion so i i thought this was a great discussion I really i enjoyed it quite a bit so with that steve how are you feeling what do you think of work today it is so wonderful to be reading this book with with you guys as such vital resources of experience and sharing i mean if i were reading this book all alone i would have broken out that sentence and noticed the correlation of the nodes and 
deduce how he came up with his relationships. I would stop there. I'm so grateful for um, our discussions about uh, uh, our, your personal experience, what you guys have done, Richard, what you've done with your, how you've practiced, how you've introduced such practical applications of these theories that most people just, you know, and and you just establish a definition, say, here's the definition we're going to use. Do we agree? And then let's implement it. You know, if this is true, what interrelationships or what relationships are there? There should be at least six. Can we find them? Mm -hmm. And are there extras? And why? You know, and uh, wow, that blows me away. So that's very, very cool. Joe, I'm so glad you brought up this metric idea here for efficacy, because Richard had mentioned the laboratory, you know, but the laboratory kind of implies calibration and calibration implies a metric. And so like, if we put laboratory together with metrics, you know, then I think that gave me a real practical handle on the definition of efficiency, of efficacy and the way you did that. And of course, there's no standard for efficacy. There's no standard for effectiveness. There's no standard for efficiency. It's whatever we determine in our community will, will apply. Based on value. Yeah, based on value. Yeah, and this comes back to principles give purpose. For me, that's how I translate it. So like the idea of like, I don't want this, uh, to me, there it's so critical. When I sit down to do a task, mm -hmm. I say, okay, what experience am I looking for here? Am I just, do I just want to get this done as fast as I possible can? Possibly can? Okay, that's my purpose today. I'm going to experience really efficient speed, right? And, uh, or is there something else I'm looking for today as I do this? Am I looking to make sure every word I put down is clearly defined? Am I, is my purpose today eliminate ambiguity? Well, I'll probably look at that same paragraph for a day. <laughs> you know, but I love this this idea of our context here. I just and it's been fun to share. So yeah, just let me say one other thing in terms please. of this effectiveness is that, again, in 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 my work with trying to come up with a training program that can have an impact or be effective in the area of suicide reduction or suicide prevention, um, there is a. Uh, an existing norm in the eyes of some critics that says that in order to be effective, you your program has to show that it's actually reduced the rate by a certain kind of percentage. Um, and yet you go to a, a, a world organization, a UN organization, like the World Health Organization, and they have concluded <clears throat> that the 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 effort to reduce something like suicide is so complex in the way in which it plays itself out in our, our society that you cannot hold a one program to the fire of, of, of reducing suicide rates all by itself. And that's been around for 20 years. And yet those who, who write studies and do research, they will they will refer to the WHO policy or standard at the in their literature review, and then at the end, it's almost like they forgot, and they will say this particular program did not reduce the rates of suicide. Therefore, in the eyes of the reader, it's a failure, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so that's where you end up being you you get people misusing what it is right. that you're trying to measure as effective, which is, I think, what Joe is really getting at, is that right. um, if you've got the wrong kind of outcome that you're trying to measure, um, uh, or you're trying to live up to in terms of efficiency standards, um, then it's it becomes harmful. It, do, it doesn't do what Bucky says it's uh, supposed to do, and that is to maintain this... It, the principles of the eternally generative. Yeah. It's not regenerative. Yeah. And I'm fighting that every day with, with uh, the literature, the research that will attack the piece that I've been working on over the years and try and denigrate it because it doesn't achieve a particular goal all by itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's... <laughs> 
And it's another that. another good place that allows me to do what you were talking about earlier, Steve. Is this this is I've just had a little bit of throwing the plates around because I'm angry <laughs> as hell. At... <laughs> good for you. <laughs> well, we're at we're eleven oh three. So in spite of the fact we started about twenty minutes late or beyond the appointed time, we were never late. We were always on time for our experience, right? Uh, uh, that's really profound. I'm going to, I put in the chat, I noticed Joe has a thing here about directed and undirected graphs. I'm going to take a look at that. That's a link in the chat. So anybody listening can look at the chat and get that. Uh, Richard, you put those formulas in here and you couldn't use um, exponential notation because you're in a linear courier type font thing here, but you did really good by adding uh, uh, parentheses and <coughs> people get it. And, and then I added a thing, how imaginary numbers are invented. And if, if that's about a half an hour long video, it's absolutely astounding. And it, in the last in the last three minutes, that's when all the good stuff happens because they convert from a real number graph and they twist 90 degrees to go into an imaginary number graph, but they don't explain that's what they're doing. And so us Bucky guys have got to go, I've got to put that in slow motion and see exactly what the heck is going on there to show the concave, the convex, the cosine, the sine, and to see that they don't exist without each other. Hmm. And if and if I don't acknowledge imaginary numbers, I it it's solving problems is very complex. And as soon as I put imaginary numbers, then problems become less complex because there's an interrelationship, not just a relationship. There's a two-way proposition. And, uh, and I love the idea of me relating to myself of A to A and B to B and C to C and D to D. I regard that as my brain and my mind or my body and my spirit. And I need to have that relationship how do I relate to my spirit? How does my spirit relate to me? And do I create an environment for my spirit? Do I create an environment for my brain? Am I self-deprecating? Uh, do I, you know, or am I training myself and becoming more and more able to meet the my intuitive uh, expectations with compassion? <laughs> anyway, so I so I don't become suicidal. <laughs> I don't want to make light of of that phenomenon because oh. we're in a tragic, tragic era uh, where people really have trouble finding any purpose in life. And it's very sad, you know? So what you guys are my geniuses. Thank you for being here. And let's hope Manu makes it back. He'll, he'll get done with his wedding. So he'll start joining humanity again. His son's getting married. And of course, Ann and Susan will be here and then we'll have more of a, we'll get less covered or be able to share less than we did tonight. <laughs> But I hope not. You guys are great. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank all you, right. everyone. Thank you.